so yeah, just one more note about um, grades and late work and all that kind of stuff. I'm still working on the lizard case studies. That's probably the one that I'll do next. And then the fruit fly labs, which will take me a while. But I did go through and check for all the late work things that you had turned in on Friday. And so I think student view should be pretty up to date unless you did things late last night or this morning. So if you see things in there that still seem missing that you did, you can just shoot me an email and let me know so I can check. I will continue checking every couple days and kind of updating the progress checks and things like that. I did also have on that previous slide, I don't know if you saw, um, we're done with the progress checks, or theoretically. So finish those up when you can, and don't forget to turn in the doc that's in homework, the homework section of classroom as well, because you're going to get additional points for kind of your little summary of how you did. And also, we are finishing the evolution unit this week. We will be having the test for this unit on Thursday. And it will cover pretty much the entire evolution unit. Um, this was a little bit shorter. It was about a two and a half week unit. Um, and so it's a little bit shorter than the genetics unit that we did before. So we'll have a test, paper and pencil test on Thursday. Questions? Okay. Then in your unit 10 notes, you can find this part. We are starting chapter 22, which is called The Origin of Species. Last week, we focused mostly on microevolution, which was the change in allele frequency in a population over generations. I did post the key to the Hardy Weinberg problems today on today's classroom post, by the way. So if you want to go back and check, um, the practice problems we did last week, I linked that in classroom today so you can check some of those problems and let me know if you have questions. But today we're going to kind of take it to the next level. When microevolution, that change in allele frequency within a population, continues to happen for a long, long extended period of time, eventually it can lead to the formation of new species, which is kind of our topic for today. So take a minute, turn and talk to somebody next to you. We're actually going to skip that one for today. Talk about this one. What is a species? Think specifically about something like those anoles, those lizards in the Caribbean that are really similar. How do you decide whether they're just two like different variations of the same species or whether we actually consider them different species? If you know this answer, talk about what you know. If you don't know, take a guess at kind of where we draw that line. Turn and talk about that for a second. All right. Do you know where we draw this line? When do we consider something a new species? Well, you are going to find out today. Um, it's not a super clear cut, always one definition kind of answer. But there is a general guideline that biologists follow when they're trying to determine if things are the same species or if they're considered separate species. When we talk about this process of forming new species, we're talking about macroevolution. Last week we talked about microevolution. Now we're talking about macroevolution, which is kind of the big scale changes. So it's broad patterns of evolution. Um, it's how one species can form into multiple different species. So it's looking at the creation of separate species and how they're related. Um, it's also looking at big changes in the history of life on Earth over time. So things like how did creatures go from just living in the oceans to becoming things that are able to walk on land, kind of those big evolutionary transitions, um, and looking at how those happened and how living things have changed and become all of these diverse kinds of species that we have. Like I said, even to biologists, the definition of a species is not crystal clear cut. 
We have what we call the biological species concept, which is kind of the guideline that's used. There are, however, a lot of exceptions to this, so it's not a hard and fast rule. This is kind of a guideline for how biologists think of what a species is. Um, a species is a group of populations or a group of individuals whose members can interbreed in nature, not just in a laboratory. They can actually interbreed in nature, and they produce viable, fertile offspring. So they are able to interbreed, they do interbreed, and they produce offspring that can also continue to reproduce. Um, in other words, a species is made up of organisms who are reproductively compatible. And if you think about that, it should kind of make sense because part of what we talk about or the main thing we talk about in evolution is what's happening to the gene pool of a population. And part of that is that all of the alleles within that population have to be mixed up through that process of sexual reproduction. And so the organisms have to be breeding with each other for that to happen, right? If they no longer breed with each other, you're going to have changes happening in one group that don't get passed on to another group. So there are lots of different examples of things that can't, some things just physically can't interbreed. I'm pretty sure in a giraffe and a lion that just like physically actually wouldn't work for them to try and interbreed. Therefore, they are obviously different species. Not to mention, I don't think they ever would, right? Um, sometimes it's a little less obvious. A horse and a donkey can interbreed. Their offspring is a mule, but mules cannot reproduce with other mules. They are sterile and they cannot breed. The only way to make a mule is to mate a horse and a donkey. That's the only way you get more mules. So a horse and a donkey can reproduce, but their offspring are not viable and fertile. Well, they are viable. They're not fertile. Viable means they will develop into a healthy adult, so mules will be a healthy animal but they're not fertile. They can't continue to reproduce. And so because their offspring are not fertile, horses and donkeys are considered separate species. There are also some species that look incredibly similar to us, like the Eastern and Western meadowlark, but because of things like where they live or their behavior, sometimes they have different mating songs or things like that, they won't interbreed in nature. Even if maybe they theoretically could, they won't, in which case they are considered separate species. Questions about this definition? So in order to form a new species, if the definition of what a species is kind of hinges on this idea of reproductive compatibility, in order for a new species to start to form, it has to become reproductively isolated. You have to have a population, a group of individuals that somehow gets separated into two groups that no longer breed with each other. Because like we said, evolution is changing the gene pool. And so in order for those groups to start evolving separately into different species, their gene pools have to be separated. Because if you continue to mix their genes together, then any mutations that happen are going to get passed through the whole thing. But if their gene pools are separate, some of them, one group, will accumulate certain mutations that will be passed on within that group if they're beneficial and become adaptations that help them survive. But the other group will have different mutations that will help them to survive. And over time, they will become more and more different and distinct. Reproductive isolation can happen in a lot of different ways. Some of them are more obvious than others. We kind of divide the mechanisms that can cause a group to become reproductively isolated into two categories. One category we talk about prezygotic barriers. Here's a word that you'll need to know to understand these terms. A zygote is a fertilized egg. So prezygotic barriers are something that happens over here when you've got an egg cell and you've got a sperm cell before they come together to create a zygote. So prezygotic barriers mean for some reason the animals either can't mate with each other, they won't mate with each other, the egg and sperm can't 
find each other and won't form a zygote. The other type of barriers are post-zygotic barriers that happen after that. So the fertilized egg then grows and develops into an organism that is a hybrid. A hybrid, remember, is a mix of two different parental types. And so a post-zygotic barrier is something that happens after fertilization so that either this organism doesn't grow and develop into a healthy animal, or it grows and develops into a healthy animal, but that animal can't reproduce, or something like that. But it's something that happens after the point of fertilization. Questions about these two different types of mechanisms. We're gonna spend the next few minutes um, with you looking at some examples of different mechanisms that cause groups to become reproductively isolated. Those of you who are in person around the room, there are eight examples. They're on the cabinets where the books are, and there's kind of one between each set of lab stations. Um, people who are at home, I am going to post a Google slide. I'll post a link here in one second to a Google slide presentation that has these eight examples for you to look at. What I'd like you to do, I don't know if you have room wherever this is printed in your note packet. If you do, you can just kind of continue these two columns. Or if you have room on the very back of your packet, you can just write yourself a note on this page and say examples on the back. I know we put one other thing on the back of your note packet, so if you don't have room there, you could grab an extra piece of paper. But basically, you want to make yourself a chart. When you look at each example, you want to classify it either as prezygotic or postzygotic. So when does that happen? and summarize enough about it that you understand what that mechanism means. It's up to you what you write down. It could be a definition. It could be an example if that's what helps you to understand it best. We'll come back together in maybe 10 or 15 minutes. We'll kind of see how long it takes you to get around to all eight of these and add these to your notes. And then we have just a little more to talk about with speciation to wrap this up for today. Any questions right now? Okay, people in class, you can go and start walking around. People at home, let me grab this link for you real quick. All right, so Kylie and Ashley... There is a link in the comments here um, to some Google Slides. You can just look through those and add those examples to your notes. There's not necessarily four prezygotic and four postzygotic. Um, I think it might end up being five and three. So you can look through those. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, stay on the meet because, like I said, in about 10 or 15 minutes when everybody's finished, we will come back together to finish up the notes. Um, it might be helpful when you're done if you either just type in the comments that you're finished taking those notes or click the raise your hand button so that I can see when you guys are done too, okay? All right.
Okay. Did you have any questions on any of those different stations, any of those examples that you looked at there? How many did you classify as prezygotic? I think there were five. Did everybody put five on that side? Yes. And three that were postzygotic? Um, I think the ones that were postzygotic were a hybrid inviability right, which means the organism doesn't develop. Hybrid infertility is that the, I forget the exact word they used, but basically it develops, but it's sterile. And hybrid breakdown, where like for one generation they're fine, but then the next generation starts to have things go wrong or is less competitive and doesn't survive as well. So those three are post-zygotic, everything else is pre-zygotic. Either they don't mate or they could, but they won't. Um, or something inhibits the actual process of fertilization. If any of those things happen and populations become reproductively isolated, then those two separate groups are going to start accumulating mutations separately. And if they're also geographically isolated, even just a little, or if they're in different habitats, then there are also different selective pressures that select for different traits and make them evolve not only with different mutations as raw material for evolution, but in different directions due to the different environments as well. But reproductive isolation is essential for new species to form. We can also classify speciation into a couple different types depending on geographically how it happens. The one that most people have maybe learned about before, and that's the easiest to visualize and understand how it happens, is called allopatric speciation. That word literally means other country. Allopatric speciation is a type of speciation um, that actually involves a geographical separation. So this is the example where like, if somehow a couple birds get blown off course and end up on an island far out to sea, they are now physically separated from the population on the mainland. They may also be in a slightly different environment. And so you can think of lots of examples of this, like the finches in the Galapagos or the tortoises or any of those kind of things that are geographically isolated and therefore um, over time accumulate different mutations to fit their specific environment. Keep in mind, just separating population is not enough to make them a different species. Even if they start to look different, if there's some microevolution that changes the shape of their shell, if they're a tortoise or the shape of their beak or whatever, that by itself does not make them different species because if someday they ended up back in the same location and they still could interbreed and they still did interbreed and they produced offspring that were fertile, they're still the same species, even though they might look different. All the different breeds of dogs we have are technically the same species. They can interbreed and make all those mixtures like cockapoos and labradoodles and all those things. The fact that they exist shows us that dogs are still the same species, even though they can look really different. So just physical separation and accumulating different appearances isn't enough. They also need that reproductive isolation piece. So even if they did come back together, they either couldn't mate or they wouldn't mate or their offspring would not be fertile or would not develop. One of those things that you just looked at also needs to be true before we consider them separate species. But it's not necessary to physically separate groups in order for speciation to happen. There's also what's called sympatric speciation, which can happen within the same environment. Um, so this is any type of speciation that happens without that geographic separation. This can happen in a lot of different ways. Polyploidy, remember, we've touched briefly on that in genetics. Polyploidy is when like the entire set of chromosomes gets duplicated. This tends to happen in plants. And if you have one set of like something similar to bananas that is 24 chromosomes, and then you have another set of bananas that has 48 chromosomes, those two probably aren't going to breed with each other because they're too genetically different. 
different habitats. So you saw some examples of that as you walked around. If things live very close to each other, but one of them prefers sandy areas and one prefers grassy areas, they're probably not going to breed with each other because they're going to breed with the ones in their same habitat. And so that can cause isolation um, or sexual selection if there's a change in color, if there's a change in behavior that affects mating. So those mating rituals or songs or any of that kind of stuff that affects the process of sexual selection that can also cause this to happen. To wrap up this discussion of speciation, we are gonna go back to our friends, the lizards in the Caribbean, just for a minute to look at how the process of speciation occurred there and try and describe it using some of the vocabulary um, that we've just talked about today. So as we watch this, we're gonna watch like a three minute section of this video. Um, and I want you to think about whether it was allopatric or sympatric speciation. Um, and what types of reproductive barriers, what types of mechanisms of isolation were happening here to keep the lizards reproductively separated? Um, Kylie and Ashley, I'm going to put a link to the Ed Puzzle for this one in the chat for you. It's only three and a half minutes, but if you would watch this right now, I will mute out our sound here in a second. Just go watch that little three and a half minute clip and then we'll come back together and talk about it and then we'll be finished for today. Okay, Kylie and Ashley, have you finished that little video clip? Yeah. Okay. So now look back at the notes from today or think about the notes from today and turn and talk to the people next to you. When you think about these lizards, was this an example of allopatric speciation or sympatric speciation? And explain why. And out of those eight different types that you looked at around the room, what types of reproductive barriers um, allowed these lizards to become different species? Turn and talk about that for a minute. Would you consider this allopatric or sympatric speciation? Sympatric. They didn't actually move to a completely different island or anything. This is all happening on one island, that they're separating into these different species. So this is sympatric speciation happening within the same area. So what kept them reproductively isolated? They talked about kind of two different things that happened in here. Yeah. Yeah, they talked a little bit about it. Maybe the first step was that lizards live near each other, but in slightly different habitats. Some lived a little bit more in the forest where it was darker. Some lived a little more in the edge or in the field where it was lighter. So that's habitat isolation, where they're in slightly different habitats. They probably still interbred a little bit, but mostly with others in their area. And during that time, some of the mutations that occurred happened to affect the color of those dewlaps, which then the darker ones were more visible and were selected for out in the sunny areas. The lighter ones were more visible and selected for in the trees. So then when they came back together, what type of barrier kept them separate then? Once their dewlap colors had changed, if they looked at each other and didn't recognize each other at the same species, physically they probably still could have mated, but they didn't. So what kind of barrier would you classify that as? Yeah. Yeah, that would be behavioral isolation. 
because they just didn't recognize each other. They looked different enough that even though at that point they probably could still reproduce and make other lizards that would go on to be able to reproduce, they didn't because the traits involved in mating, so this is an example kind of a sexual selection, right? The females are choosing not to mate with the males that have the wrong color dewlap, and that keeps the population separate, and so they continue to evolve different traits. And then if they end up in different parts of the canopy layers, they evolve those different traits that we talked about before and the different body types that eventually makes them completely, obviously, very different looking types of lizards. Do you have any questions about how this process of speciation works? We're gonna to continue to look at speciation over the next couple days, um, a little more from the genetic aspect and at some specific genes that are really important in the process of speciation. Um, but that is where we are leaving off for today. So Kylie and Ashley, you're welcome to sign off for today. Remember, if you're interested in taking a mock exam, please try and fill out that Google form that's in the stream in classroom as soon as you can. Um, look at your calendar so you're sure you can make it. And Kylie and Ashley, feel free to shoot me an email if you are interested in setting up some review times or whatever and let me know kind of what you're thinking about all that stuff um, if there's not enough places on that form to give information, okay? Otherwise, we will see you tomorrow. Thank you, bye. Bye.